Good morning. Thank you for joining the Emerging Issues in Health Law Dis 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 Disciplinary Penalties and COVID-19 Impacts. A few housekeeping notes. If you experience technical difficulties at any point, please exit the meeting and re-enter with the URL previously provided. This webinar is being recorded and LexisNexis Canada will distribute the link in a timely manner. As COVID-19 events continue to unfold and have an impact on how law is practiced, the cases and heard and remotely in court, LexisNexis Canada continues to provide information and resources to the legal community. The Practice Advisor Coronavirus page provides a document kit that can be downloaded for free. Visit www.lexisnexis.ca forward slash COVID-19 for more information. We hope you're keeping safe and thank you for doing your part to flatten the curve. Today's webinar will now begin. I would like to introduce the moderator, Timon Sisik of LexisNexis Canada. Hello all, and welcome to the LexisNexis webinar, Emerging Issues in Health Law. Just wanna activate our videos here. We hope everyone is staying safe and we're uh, glad to have you virtually with us today. This webinar is accredited for one substantive hour of CPD credit. Our panelists today have some high quality content to share. So in the interest of maximizing the time for their presentations and the questions that will follow, um, we're going to keep this introduction very short. We will have, have about 15 minutes for each presenter and we will then um, have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to have a question and answer period. If you have any questions throughout, please put them in the question and answer box. Uh, and I will field those questions towards the end to our panelists. So with that, first on our panel, we have Ms. Valerie Wise, who has practiced health law for over 25 years, defending health professionals in both civil litigation and regulatory proceedings at their respective health colleges. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Wise has been a certifi certified as a specialist in health law by the Law Society of Ontario since 2012 and is included in the Best Lawyers in Canada 2021 edition for the healthcare law and medical negligence. Our next panelist, Fernanda Lorenko, is an in house counsel to Dynacare Inc. and an expert in Canadian healthcare regulation. Ms. Lorenko manages hundreds of Dynacare's licenses and accreditations, maintaining them all in good standing. Her expertise is extended into the private laboratory licensing processes and changes in the midst of COVID the COVID 19 pandemic. She will be touching on these subjects today. Emma Gardner is an associate at Rosen Sunshine LLP. Emma has worked uh, on a variety of matters involving the representation of regulated health professionals before the various committees of the numerous colleges regulating health professionals in Ontario. She also provides advice and opinions to health professionals, institutions, and individuals on various health-related issues. Clancy Keck. Catalin is also an associate at Rosen Sunshine LLP. Clancy assists healthcare professionals, institutions, and individuals by providing opinions and advice on a variety of health-related legal matters. She also represents regulated health professionals and health organizations before uh, courts and tribunals. Clancy holds an honors bachelor's of arts with distinction in bioethics and French studies from the University of Toronto and a Juris Doctor from the University of Windsor. Now, without further ado, I turn the presentation over to Ms. Wise to start us off. Thank you, Timon. Um, so I am going to be presenting on discipline hearings post-pandemic. Um, my colleague, Rosemond Metarata, and I did a lengthy discipline hearing in July um, that I will be um, speaking to in terms of lessons learned, concerns we had before, and how those concerns played out in the course of the hearing. Um, but before I get to that, I want to start with an, an explanation of the situation of these types of hearings, so these tribunal hearings, uh, prior to COVID-19. So next. Thank you. Um, so under the Statutory Powers Procedure Act, tribunals can make rules to, that allow them to have what they call electronic hearings, so hearings that are not in person. 
Um, so I've given you here the particular um, sections of the SPPA. Um, there, the exception is if a party can satisfy the tribunal that holding an electronic, rather, there's a typo, than an oral hearing is likely to cause the party <coughs> significant prejudice. Um, and there is a specific notice that has to go out so everyone is on notice that the tribunal is planning this and then the parties can make submissions as to prejudice. So the key prior to um, the pandemic was that the rules of the tribunal had to provide for the electronic hearing and then you immediately went to a discussion of whether or not conducting the hearing as an electronic hearing was likely to cause significant prejudice. Next. Um, we did a case back in 2018 that squarely raised the issue, so just before COVID-19. Um, and it was in front of the College of Massage Therapists of Ontario and Registrant M. And there relied on, on some previous cases where the test was set out in sort of two parts. First of all, is it within the panel's jurisdiction to consider the proposed order for an electronic hearing? And that, again, typically you would look to, you know, is, does the SPPA apply? And if it does, has the tribunal generated rules that would allow it to conduct an electronic hearing? And if so, then you move to the second part of the test, which was, is it appropriate to hold an, an electronic hearing in this case? Next. So on that second preliminary issue, whether it was appropriate, um, in the course of arguing this particular case at the CMTO, at the College of Massage Therapists, um, the panel developed a, a sort of a two-part threshold test before you even get to um, or I guess in, in determining whether or not it was appropriate. And the threshold was the question, is the witness truly unavailable? And are there no other options that would permit the witness to testify? So prior to COVID-19, it was a pretty high threshold um, to be able to um, get an electronic hearing or convince a tribunal to do an electronic hearing. And the cases were typically situations where the witness that was at issue um, was not compellable. So the, although we referred to electronic hearings, often the issue would arise with respect to a particular witness or group of witnesses. So the hearing itself was, was proceeding in person, but there would be a witness or two um, that wanted to attend electronically over a video conference. And the case law, as I say, primarily looked at, for example, is the witness outside of the jurisdiction and so otherwise not compellable. So the only way we can get them is if they agree to participate and the only way that they will agree is to be able to attend electronically by video conference because they don't want to travel. Those were typically the cases prior to COVID-19. Um, and it was only then once you were over that threshold of establishing that the witness was truly unavailable, that you would get to the questions of whether an electronic hearing would cause significant prejudice. Um, and then the last one was fairly easy to satisfy. You had to have all parties and panel members able to hear one another. So in the CMTO case that we did, um, the witness involved who wanted to attend electronically was the actual complainant, so a very significant and important witness. Um, we, on behalf of the member, objected. The evidence before the panel was a medical note that the complainant had from her physician who said that it would be difficult for her to travel. She lived about two hours outside of Toronto and would have had to travel to, to Toronto. Um, and we argued that that was not enough, that that evidence did not rise to the level of the witness being truly unavailable. And the panel agreed with us. So the panel found that while they recognized that this would be a hardship for the complainant. The evidence did not rise to the level of the witness being truly unavailable. And so they denied the order um, and they did not permit her to attend by way of video conference. So prior to COVID-19, as I say, we were typically looking at individual witnesses attending electronically as opposed to the entire uh, hearing proceeding that way, and it was a very high threshold that the, um, that the witness or the party calling the witness had to meet in order to get that uh, permission from the panel. And then enter COVID-19. <laughs> Next, please. Um, 
So first of all, we had the Hearings and Tribunal Proceedings Temporary Measures Act that was enacted by the province. Uh, and this allowed for a tribunal to conduct a hearing in person, electronically, in writing, or by a combination of any of them as the tribunal considers appropriate. And the Act provided that tribunals could create their own directions and orders and rules in order to facilitate that. Um, in combination with that, we also had the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, which capped the number of people who could gather in any one location. Um, and so that um, obviously posed a problem when we were looking at scheduling a contested discipline hearing where we were going to have a panel, like a tribunal of five um, there would be counsel on both sides, there would be witnesses, there would be the court reporter, um, so a large number of people participating that would have exceeded the cap, um, certainly. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the early post-pandemic um, case law, so we started to see cases developing in situations of examinations for discovery or appeals or applications where counsel was attending, but you didn't have live witnesses. I mean, I, I, I recognize we have a live witness at an examination for discovery, but that's not the ultimate hearing. Um, so when we were dealing with these issues back in May and in June, um, there weren't very many, if any, uh, trials that had proceeded with live witnesses or hearings with live witnesses. We initially objected to the proposed hearing proceeding by way of an electronic hearing, um, primarily because we had uh, the case involved allegations of sexual abuse. So the stakes for our client, the member, were very, very high. We wanted an opportunity to cross-examine the complainant in person, and we were concerned of the impacts that that was going to have um, if we proceeded by way of an electronic hearing. So we initially objected, and we tried to distinguish those uh, that other case law where it was um, a situation of an application or an appeal on the basis that those cases did not involve live witnesses. We were unsuccessful in our objection. Um, and the panel ordered that the entire hearing proceed by way of an electronic hearing. So we did go ahead. It was about a two-week hearing in July. Uh, so what I want to do now is talk through some of the concerns that we had prior to the hearing uh, and how we saw those play out or not play out in the course of the actual hearing. Um, so next, just checking my time here. Um, so one of the concerns that we had was the ability to see the witnesses. So as I described, we had a number of participants. We had a five-person tribunal as opposed to a court with a single judge. Um, and we were dealing with exhibits. And so as soon as you screen share, the heads, the talking heads, get even smaller. So we were very concerned about that. That turned out to be an actual concern. Um, certainly, while we were dealing with exhibits, it, we could not see everybody, and uh, the, the faces were very, very small. We were concerned about witnesses, um, and this was an issue. You don't necessarily know whether every witness, what, what hardware do they have? Um, certainly, we're not going to be providing uh, laptop computers to witnesses. That affects um, your ability to see them. It affects their ability to see you. We ran into issues with Wi-Fi versus Ethernet connections, and I would highly recommend that you uh, have your witnesses wired by way of Ethernet as opposed to Wi-Fi so that you don't uh, run into issues. Um, you're always worried that do the witnesses have documents in the room, and we ran into that on one occasion where, unbeknownst to us, the witness had a, had a, um, a summary memo <laughs> with her while she was testifying. We had to deal with that. Um, we were worried about whether or not there would be any coaching, but that did not turn out to be an issue in our case. Next. The whole issue of examination and cross-examination, um, we're all more accustomed now to Zoom than, than we were initially. Um, there is something lost in the body language. There is something lost in the eye contact. 
and those of you who do trials or hearings, you know that there is a, it, it is a bit of a drama, it is a bit of a process, and your ability to influence the witness um, one way or the other is somewhat lost when you're going through a, an electronic hearing. We did have situations with glitches, um, loss of audio, loss of video. We very quickly moved to the witnesses had to be connected through their phones by audio with Zoom only managing the video component. And that way, even if there were glitches and, and times when it froze, we were able to preserve the transcript. So I would highly recommend that if you're doing an electronic hearing. And we were worried that um, while a judge may be in a better position to determine credibility over an electronic hearing, we had a tribunal of lay people who this was probably the first time ever that they would be assessing credibility. And we were less confident that they would be able to do that electronically and without being in the actual room. Next. This was a real concern for me um, as defense counsel. I am used to being right beside my client um, where I can be reassuring. I can be some emotional support. Um, they can speak to me, pass notes to me in the middle of the hearing, and that was a challenge. I felt very, very sorry for my client who was isolated in a room alone, um, going through something that was extraordinarily stressful for her. That was very, very difficult for her. We uh, used a texting kind of an application on our computers to communicate mid-hearing. So... Um, I had my other computer set up beside me and we would be able to communicate back and forth that way. But the emotional support aspect for my client, I think, was, was very lacking and it, it really affected our rapport, for sure. There was also a concern around the transparency. This was supposed to be an open hearing. The college did set up um, a way for members of the public to register and then listen in. They were not allowed to see, they were not allowed a visual um, link, only an audio link, and that was explained to us that there was just not the broadband, the broadband width to be able to do that. Um, and we had, so we had concerns around that. Next. As I said, we did run into some, com some technical glitches. The complainant really, really struggled with his connection, um, and we lost hours. Uh, the court reporter at one time lost her, her complete network. <laughs> Um, and we were down for about an hour and a half for that. So it, it, we did lose time for sure. Um, I think there was an impact on the rapport and interaction with the tribunal. It was harder to read them. It was harder to pick up on um, cues as to what was working, what wasn't working. Um, you very much need a fantastic hearing coordinator and, and full credit to her we did have one who was very very good with the technical support and very quick in the organization the way that we did exhibits was um, we had a joint brief but then in addition to that each side the member and the college had additional exhibits they were all provided to the hearing coordinator ahead of time and labeled like R for registrant 1 through 40 or whatever, and then C 1 through 30 for the college. And in the course of the hearing, we would simply ask the hearing coordinator to put up that exhibit, and she would have to pull it up and um, screen share it. And then once it had been marked as an exhibit, they used SharePoint uh, software to then have it cat cataloged in a, in a format where everyone could access it online so the panel could then access the exhibits online once they'd been marked as an exhibit. Um, so it worked fairly well, that aspect of it worked fairly well, but you need to have a really fantastic hearing coordinator um, organizing all of that. Next. We were worried about Zoom fatigue, um, and so we ran the hearing from 9.30 every day until 4.30. 4 o'clock, I think, 4 or 4.30, um, but had, and had multiple breaks during the day, but that was definitely an issue. In terms of the efficiency, um, you lost time having to negotiate and literally litigate the form of the hearing, um, so that was not par particularly efficient for counsel and the clients. You eliminated travel time, which was lovely. Uh, you were sitting at your desk in your office with everything around you throughout the hearing, which um, was, I really appreciated that. 
organizing for the hearing again you have the technical part in addition to the substantive part but the upside again was no lugging large briefs around everything was electronic and that was great um, camera angles i've put that in here think about that that's an issue sometimes if the camera is high and it's pointing down it it conveys something in terms of even um, subconsciously in terms of your impression of the witness and you always have to be worried around privacy and security. But as I say, we had a hearing coordinator who um, used software to make sure that people didn't have unauthorized access to what we were doing. Next. So thoughts in closing. Um, I have to say it wasn't as challenging as I thought it was going to be. Um, but I really do think that there are, there are intangibles lost for hearings involving live witnesses and I know we're here right now and we have to keep things moving as best we can but I really do hope that once we're through this um, pandemic that hearings at least involving live witnesses uh, that we return to an in-person more in-person uh, formats thank you thank you Ms. Ms. Wise some great insights and uh, great things to look out for on coming trials or motions um, now we're turning it over to Ms. Lorenko, and she's going to be talking about COVID-19 uh, changes to laboratory licensing and clinical trials. Uh, thanks, Simon, for the introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to participate in this webinar. In the interest of time, I will just provide a very high-level information about laboratory licensing and clinical trials and how COVID-19 affected both industries. Uh, next. Regarding laboratory licensing, I will just focus on Ontario only because um, there's not enough time to discuss the other provinces. Next. The Ontario legislation regulating laboratory license are the Laboratory and Specimen Collection Center License Act from 1990 and Regulation 682 and 683. The, uh, these laws govern not only the licensing aspect of laboratory licensing, but also the collection of human specimens. Uh, next. These are the main uh, government players in the laboratory industry. The Ministry of Health and the Institute for Quality Management in Healthcare are the most important one because they play more active roles and they make the final decisions about laboratory testing. The mandate of these four organizations is to ensure uh, safety, quality, and accuracy of tests in Ontario. Uh, next. Now, I'm going to briefly explain uh, the licensing process, which starts with an application that's submitted to the Ministry of Health. Organizations cannot perform any laboratory testing without having a license. In addition, every individual test performed by a lab must be applied for and approved by the Minister of Health. The application contains a very detailed information, and just some of them are listed in this slide. The applicants need to prove that they have the proper facilities to run the tests. We need to describe the analyzers, uh, the reagents. Who are the medical experts overseeing the test? Uh, how sample stability is maintained during the transportation, etc. And there is also another separate process that takes place regarding the validation of the test. And this process is handled by the Institute for Quality Management in Healthcare. So if everything is in place, uh, the Minister of Health will approve the application and we will allow the laboratory to perform the test, and which gets added to the applicant's license. So let's move on to the next slide. But there are some nuances to this process. There are some situations where the laboratory can prove its capacity to run the test, but the Minister of Health won't approve the application uh, because only some very specific organizations can perform some types of tests. It's usually related to funding in most cases. The government has special funding uh, for some types of tests, and all organizations uh, participating in those fundings are able to perform them, which this is quite, uh, quite common in genetic testing in Ontario. Another example is uh, 
diseases such as SARS, Ebola, HIV, some rare diseases. Uh, only Public Health Ontario uh, can perform those tests. The Minister of Health won't issue license to the private labs, and there are several reasons for that. One of them is that the Public Health Ontario has a very specialized team to perform the tests, and they also have a special accreditation. In addition, there are several epidemiology programs connected to the tests, and all of these require centralization. The government needs to maintain control of the data, as well as surveillance of those diseases. So it's better for the government to keep everything in the same lab. And COVID-19 actually falls under that category of testing. Uh, next. So when COVID-19 uh, cases started to appear in Canada, as expected, only public health was testing the samples. But unfortunately, uh, the volume of cases became uh, increasingly large, and public health was not able to handle the volume for the entire province anymore. So for this reason, the Minister of Health decided to open the licensing process for COVID to the private laboratories. And this decision was communicated to the private labs in March this year. It was like an urgent situation that required the support of our organizations in the laboratory industry. So the private labs came together, applied for the license, they were able to prove their capacity, and they started performing the tests. But you may, now you may think now, like, uh, how is public health monitoring the number of cases if it now the test is performed by other labs? It's not a centralized process anymore. Well, there was a change that was introduced to the reporting of the results, which is in normal circumstance, I only release to the treating physicians and to patients in most cases unless it's a sensitive type of test. Uh, in this case, only the treating physicians are get the results and they communicate them to their patients. But when it comes to COVID-19, in addition to reporting the results to the treating physicians, uh, the laboratories are required to notify public health about the positive results. So this way, uh, the government was still able to keep all data centralized in one organization. Uh, next, please. Uh, most of you may have heard that you can now get tested for COVID at pharmacies. There are several of them spread across Ontario offering this service. Again, uh, the Minister of Health is addressing the pandemic as it evolves, and one concern is the long lineups at the public assessment centers. The waiting time to get tests is extremely long. So there is an urgent uh, need to increase test capacity, Therefore, another change to the legislation was necessary, and it came into effect on uh, September 18. Uh, the, go uh, the governing legislation uh, actually lists uh, who are the healthcare professionals that can order lab tests, and pharmacists are not included. So there actually, there are some few exceptions to this rule, which, which I want to be able to explain now. In addition, uh, no one can collect human specimens for laboratory testing without having a license. This license is called the Specimen Collection Center License. So an amendment uh, to, uh, to change the regulations 682 and 683. Uh, and this amendment allows pharmacists to uh, order COVID-19 tests, as well as to exempt them from the licensing requirements. But I just want to mention that uh, pharmacists can only uh, order tests for asymptomatic patients. Symptomatic patients still have to go to the public assessment centers. I have been part of the licensing process of several types of COVID tests in Ontario. Uh, I've heard about COVID-19 by PCR, maybe the antibody test, uh, maybe the saliva test, etc. I, I, I feel like very fortunate uh, for being able to participate in those uh, licensing processes and make my small but important contribution in addressing this pandemic. As I said, like I was able to get the license for DynaCare and we are now performing thousands of tests daily. So now I'd like to move to my next topic with clinical trials. Uh, next, please. 
again, uh, interest of time, I will just provide a very high level information about clinical trial process in Canada and how they were affected by the pandemic. Uh, next. In this slide, I just inserted a definition of clinical trials, which is in summary a research study involving the participation of several people with the objective of testing new, new drug, new diet, or new device, and see if those products are more effective and have uh, maybe less side effects than the current products in the market. Uh, next. The clinical trials have several phases. Uh, it always starts with preclinical phase, where the drug is usually tested on animals, not always, but usually. Uh, the manufacturers present a plan to the FDA where they explain how they want to test the experimental drug on trials. And if they have the approval, uh, the trial will start, and those manufacturers are now called uh, sponsors. Then the trial moves into phase one which involves the participation of a fairly small number of people, I would say between 20 to 80, and those are health people. They have no underlying conditions. And the objective of this phase is to check the side effects of this drug as well as the right dosage. So then the trial moves into phase uh, two, uh, then where the number of participants is between 100 to 300, and these are not health people anymore. The sponsors want to trust the drug or device on people uh, uh, with certain conditions. The emphasis of this phase is on effectiveness. And this phase can actually last several years. Then the trial moves into phase three, uh, which now has a much larger uh, number of participants that can range from several hundreds uh, to up to 3,000, and sometimes even more. At this point, there is a combination of different populations, different doses, combination with other drugs. And if, if FDA uh, agrees that the results of those trials are positive, it will approve the drug or the device, and uh, they can be commercialized uh, from this point. But the trial doesn't stop there. Um, there is a phase, phase four, that we call uh, aftermarket where the sponsors still want to monitor the long-term uh, long side effects of the product. Uh, next. I'm going to discuss now uh, some changes introduced to the clinical trials as a result of the pandemic. The immediate change was related to the management of the trials. Health Canada released a notice to the sponsors regarding the management of the trials during the pandemic. The trial still needed to be conducted in accordance with the Canadian Food and Drug Regulations. The sponsors still needed to require approval from Health Canada and from the Research Ethics Board. However, there are some deviations to the process that uh, would be acceptable. As long as those deviations were documented, notified in some cases, and there are no risks to the participants. Some of those deviations may be the participants uh, may need to self-isolate or the healthcare professionals involved in the trials uh, may be deployed to other emergencies. Or sometimes the trial can be conducted virtually nowadays. Or the drug can be shipped to the participants' homes if the trial uses a drug or a device that doesn't require the administration by a health professional. Also, the sponsors. Uh, may need to consider uh, suspending the trials or maybe stop uh, recruitment, etc. This is just to list a few, but there is like, there's a lot of deviation that could be acceptable by Health Canada. Uh, next, please. Now I'm going to talk about changes related to the importation of drugs and uh, medical devices into Canada. The changes were introduced by Health Canada through an interim order, which was released on March 30th. It's just regarding the importation of drugs, uh, foods for diets, and uh, medical devices related to COVID-19. This interim order was really necessary to ensure a quicker and more flexible approval of the importation of such products. Next. Here I listed some of the main changes, uh, and the most important ones, in my opinion, are that uh, Health Canada will authorize of these products, even if they don't meet all the requirements 
of the Canadian food and uh, drug regulations, for example, labeling. And the applications will receive priority as well. Uh, it allows the, a wider range of investigators, uh, such as physicians, because uh, before the interim order, only sponsors could uh, run the trials. Next. Continuation here. Uh, there is also no need to go through the quality assurance process in Canada if the manufacturer has already an accreditation or approval from a trusted uh, regulatory organization, for example, from the FDA, meaning uh, the products were manufactured according to comp uh, comparable uh, standards. Uh, the fees were waived, and the interim order is uh, only valid for one year, but may be subject to renewal, uh, which is going to be based on the ongoing uh, public health need. Uh, next. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. I, I hope it was um, uh, useful and interesting, and thank you very much for your attention. If any of you would like to contact me, you can find me on LinkedIn by my full name, with Fernanda Welzo Lorenko. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lorenko. Very informative. Um, uh, we'll be moving on to uh, Ms. Catalan's uh, presentation here in a moment. Ms. Catalan, are you here with us? I'm here, yes, and uh, Emma Gardner as well. And yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, thanks for those wonderful presentations and Clancy and I are happy to be here as well. We're gonna be speaking to you about uh, the case that's referenced here, Con versus um, the College of Physicians of Ontario. And this was before the discipline committee of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Uh, and uh, so I'll just start with giving you some of the, the facts. Clancy and I will kind of bounce back and forth uh, in explaining this very interesting case to you. So this case arose from a criminal charge of sexual assault against Dr. Khan. There are a number of criminal charges that will automatically be considered as an act of professional misconduct. In this case, it was uh, sexual assault. And um, the facts of this case were it was actually a sexual assault of a 16-year-old boy while Dr. Khan was uh, a medical resident. And uh, it involved uh, sexual relations while Dr. Khan believed that this 16-year-old um, AB was asleep. Uh, AB actually reported this to the police a uh, number of years after it actually occurred and Dr. Khan pled guilty to the criminal charges and uh, received an absolute discharge in connection with the criminal charges. And now I'm going to turn it over to Clancy to give some details of the procedural history of the discipline committee's case and talk to you about the law of joint submissions. Thank you, Emma. So this case has quite a long procedural history. They started out in April of 2018. And at that time, the positions of the position of the college was that they were seeking um, a revocation of Dr. Khan's certificate of registration. They wanted him to be reprimanded and also to pay costs for a four day hearing. Um, Counsel for Dr. Khan was seeking instead eight to 12 months suspension and costs for one day. Um, so right, right after, about a month, I believe it is, in May 2018, we get a new set of rules coming in to the professional code that makes revocation a mandatory penalty for certain prescribed offenses, including sexual assault. Um, so in this case, that, that, um, that new regulation, they needed to determine whether it could apply retrospectively to Dr. Khan's conduct, which had happened, um, I believe, even 10 years before the case made it, before the CPSO. So that was one issue that caused some delays and uh, was a live issue in many tribunal hearings at that time. And 
there was also the issue of how they should consider the absolute discharge, whether it had an effect on on um, on whether they needed to find that an act of professional misconduct. So fast forward about a year later, we get the Kuninets case, which confirms that the new regulation cannot be applied retrospectively, um, where the conduct predates the regulation. So Dr. Khan's conduct predates the regulation. This opens up negotiations again with the college around revocation. So a joint submission follows, and instead of revocation, both the college and Dr. Khan's counsel are asking that Dr. Khan be suspended for 12 months, receive a reprimand, and pay costs for a two-day hearing. Um, so a little bit about joint submissions. Joint submissions are submissions in that the panel still gets to decide whether they're going to accept submissions. But that said, it's extremely unusual for a tribunal to reject joint submissions. The bar is quite high. There are a few reasons for this. One, it's great from a policy perspective. You have reduced costs. You generally have an outcome that's considered reasonable by both sides and falls within a range of reasonable uh, dispositions for the matter. But then you also have a legal test and the legal test is quite stringent. This comes out of a 2016 case called Anthony Cook. Um, they stated in that case that a tribunal should not depart from joint submissions unless the proposed penalty would bring the administration of justice into disrepute or is otherwise not in the public interest. So there is some latitude there, but it's still a very high standard. Um, Emma, would you like to speak about what they decided in this case? Uh, yes, I would be happy to. So um, there actually, in this case, there was a majority and a dissent. Clancy will be speaking to you about the dissent afterwards. But so three of the five panel members uh, decided to reject uh, the joint submission on penalty. And they found that uh, the proposed penalty was so disproportionate to the uh, conduct that was at issue that accepting it would bring the administration of justice into disrepute, uh, which as Clancy has just explained is a very high standard. It's not very often that you would see a committee rejecting a joint submission on penalty uh, because it is such a high standard. And um, they based this decision both on, they thought that it was disproportionate compared to other cases, and also that it didn't serve any of the penalty principles um, that are generally considered in determining penalties. So I'm going to focus on the second uh, um, aspect there, you're walking through the applicable penalty principles, their analysis, and then also my own comments and thoughts on that analysis. So, um, you know, there are a number of, of penalty principles that are considered in, in every case, including protection of the public, specific and general uh, deterrence, the maintenance of the honor of the profession and the public confidence, and um, also the whether the particular facts of the case um, have aggregate, aggravating factors or mitigating factors in play. So in considering the protection of the public, the discipline committee was satisfied based on uh, expert evidence that was prevented, presented by a number of psychiatrists that over the 10 years um, intervening, Dr. Khan had received a lot of um, therapy and psychi psychiatric help and they were satisfied that he didn't present any greater risk of uh, recurrence than any other member of, of the public. They were satisfied based on expert evidence of that. And they also, regarding specific deterrence, so deterrence of Dr. Khan and deterrence of the medical profession at large, they felt that he was already deterred from his own remorse and his own um, efforts to improve himself. Uh, regarding general deterrence, they noted that he was 
was actually a medical resident at the time and was not a member of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. So it wouldn't deter medical residents or medical students from engaging in contact in this type of conduct. And that I would say uh, is a bit questionable in my opinion, because um, there is a requirement for anyone joining a, a profession, including the College of Physicians and Surgeons of a good character requirement. So when you are applying to become a member of a college, they can actually consider your, your previous conduct. So that logic there seems a little questionable, in my opinion. Uh, and another interesting aspect of the majority's reasoning is that in considering the maintenance of the honor of the profession and the public confidence, they actually found that um, accepting this, accepting this joint submission, you know, would decrease the public confidence because it was so harsh compared to the conduct. And they also uh, were very critical of the college of pursuing revocation of Dr. Khan's certificate, uh, as Clancy had mentioned, sort of from the beginning and very shortly up until the time that, uh, that they did agree on a joint submission. They actually referred to this as a draconian measure uh, in, in relation to the conduct in this case, which is quite, quite strong criticism of, of the college in this, in this case. And uh, one other aspect of the decision that was quite interesting the, in the mitigating factors they found that his age, the age of the victim in this case, was a mitigating factor, uh, an aggregating factor, I'm sorry, as, as he was uh, 16 years old. As a mitigating factor, they recognized that Dr. The, the assault took place when Dr. Khan was a young gay man struggling to express his identity in particularly trying circumstance. And although they acknowledged that his sexual identity Sorry, Ms. Gardner, it seems like you cut out there for a second. I'm not sure. I seem to have gotten cut off oh, there. I don't you're, know you're, if... You're, um, back. you're back now. I don't know if anyone hear. can hear me here. Yes, I can hear you. You're, you're back. Hello, Emma? It seems like we've lost Emma for a moment. Uh, Clancy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'll take I'll take it from here, uh, and Emma can join back in if she gets her uh, her mic back online. So what Emma what Emma was speaking about is that they considered it a mitigating factor that uh, Dr. Khan was uh, confused about his sexuality at this time, and that this somehow was related to that. Um, a lot of people have reacted, and I think rightly to question that, that logic as it seems to rest on some stereotypes of, of gay people and in particular of gay men, that the gay community has worked very hard to dispose of and to fight against and to have this put in a decision of, um, of the CPSO is, is a bit concerning. Um, so that, that is what uh, Emma was going to speak about. I think that, that that was the end point there for her. That she might have more to say when she comes back. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the dissent just quickly before, um, before we move on to questions. So the, there were two dissenting members of the panel. So it was a panel of five, three uh, were the majority and the two dissenting members would have accepted the joint submission. Um, in providing their reasons, they highlighted just how high the bar really um, is supposed to be and quoted the Anthony Cook case to say that the rejection of a joint submission indicates that the submission is so unhinged from the circumstances of the offender 
and the offense that its acceptance would lead reasonable and informed persons to believe that the proper function of the justice system had broken down. This is a huge statement, and it's a bit difficult to see how that test is met here. Um, to give some perspective for those of you who are not familiar with penalties and regulated health professions, this joint submission was already quite a light penalty considering the conduct. And I think that Dr. Khan could have walked away considering this, um, for lack of a better word, a win for him in that he, he got to continue to practice medicine and, um, you know, his costs were reduced. Uh, so speaking to costs, that's another element of, that is so interesting here because the colleges in general have moved to almost a default system of, of costs for members who find themselves in, in front of the discipline committee. There's a tariff system where you're charged a daily rate. Um, in this case, that was about $10,000 per day. So even Dr. Khan thought it was reasonable that he pay some amount and then to have the, the panel reject that and say he pays nothing uh, is quite remarkable and it's not something that we see very often. Um, part of the reasoning behind this system of costs is the idea that the rest of the profession should not have to bear the cost of the discipline process for those who do find themselves uh, in professional uh, discipline hearings. Uh, so this system of tariffs is supposed to address that. Um, this case is set to be appealed and we're watching it very closely because of how, uh, how many sort of settled principles around costs and joint submissions uh, have really been challenged here. Uh, so we'll certainly be uh, interested to see how that goes and um, we'll be updating everyone about that when, when we hear more. Okay, thank you, Ms. Catlin. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. If you can hear us, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for the, the excellent insights. I'm going to I'm going to open up the question and answer um, box here and go through a few. I do have some questions myself as well, so um, we'll run through some of those as well. Um, so we have a question asked, what is, I, I believe this is directed to um, Ms. Catalan and uh, Ms. Gardner here, what is the usual discipline in these types of cases? Now I know Ms. Gatlin, you said that um, typically it's it's quite a bit higher, but in these sort of sexual um, misconduct cases, what, what's a typical range of uh, penalties that we can expect? It's a bit of a difficult question. Um, what I would like to highlight, though, is that the CPSO in particular and a lot of the colleges, they've made a huge effort to make uh, sexual assault and sexual abuse within the health professions uh, a thing of the past and this is something that they certainly focus on I think in the way that they make decisions and um, something that doesn't come up in in the con case that is also something to keep on your radar if this is uh, an area you're interested in is that the college also frequently awards not a cost but um, they charge, uh, I, I'm, I feel like fee is the wrong word, I'm sorry, it's escaping me the exact word, but um, you pay into a fund for the uh, complainant to receive therapy um, in, uh, yes, in an effort yeah. to address the, the harm that's been done. Oh, Emma, we have you back? Yeah, so there are provisions of the Health Professions Procedural Code that um, permit a college to order members who have committed uh, acts of sexual abuse to provide, to pay for the victim counseling. And that's what, I, and that's, I don't have much else. I would just add that if Dr. Khan was, um, if he was guilty of the same offense today, it would be automatic revocation. So, 
um, at the time he committed the act, it wasn't an automatic revocation, but the provisions of the law have since changed and he, he would be, um, his license would be revoked. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just have a follow-up question on that in terms of when we were discussing costs, you know, from the context of, um, from the context of court proceedings, right? Um, success on a motion or a, or a hearing of any type is one of the biggest factors in determining who's going to pay costs and how much, um, it, it's how, how much does that play into this? Because it seems sort of co controversially to me that, um, Mr. Khan was not successful in his joint submission, although he got better, a better outcome. Right. So I, I wonder, was that taken into consideration or do you think it should have been taken into consideration? Um, I do think it's very unusual that there was no costs ordered in this case. The committee said that, you know, he shouldn't have to pay costs because the joint submission was basically what his position was at first instance. He said, I think I should get 12 months. And the college said, no, I think you should be revoked. And they had a contested hearing about that until, you know, the divisional court said, actually, you know, this new law doesn't apply retroactively, so it's not automatic revocation. And then the college changed their position and agreed to a joint submission. So I guess in that way, the committee was kind of saying um, he was success, like what he was saying at first instance is what they submitted on the, the joint submission. But, um, you know, he was still found guilty of professional misconduct and as Clancy had said there's that sort of idea that the membership as a whole shouldn't have to to bear the cost through their membership fees for members that are guilty of professional misconduct so I do think it was very un unusual that no costs were ordered and mm -hmm. even uh, if, if you look at this decision the cost section is is one line um, mm -hmm. so there were very little reasons given around that which is again unusual given that it's not um, it's not the type of finding that that the college has been generally uh, putting forward mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question for Ms. Lorenko. Uh, this is with respect to uh, t testing on COVID-19 positive cases. Now, I understand that uh, there's there are reporting requirements to public health, um, but what are the what are the privacy limitations on um, on the type of information? Uh, just just a general overview. I mean, if I go as a as a private individual and ask whether somebody is, uh, has tested positive for COVID-19 or not. I assume that I, I don't have access to that. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, there is a mandatory reporting of several types of diseases that are reported to public health. So mm -hmm. COVID-19 is not like something unusual that must be reported. So let's suppose if someone has tested positive for HIV, for example, it's also a mandatory uh, type of uh, reporting. So for COVID, uh, the principles were the same. So, and it's all secured with public health. So the laboratories just continue doing the, the, the same uh, type of reporting, but regarding a different type of disease. And uh, the reporting is done through a system called OLIS, which uh, all the laboratories and hospitals are connected, and it's a very secure system. Mm. So, for, so that's how uh, it, uh, it's been uh, happening with not only COVID, but with the other uh, types of mandatory reporting. Okay, thank you. And I have uh, okay. one, last, one last question. This one is going to Ms. Wise about the, um, her experiences. Ms. Wise, I, I don't see you on the cameras here, but I... I'm here. I, I maybe oh, okay. it's just yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now that um, my my question is um, normally uh, going through exhibits in a hearing. It, you have that issue of sort of um, please turn to page four of exhibit next. And did you find that this was it, it was easier online to simply say 
this is the exhibit we're looking at and then everybody's looking at essentially the same thing. It was easier. So the hearing coordinator, you know, I would say, hearing coordinator, please pull up document R or whatever, and she would put it up and then we'd say turn to page three and then we'd tell her how to scroll it and then it would be there. So you're quite right. It is, it, you know that the panel is looking in the right place. Um, you know that the witness is looking in the right place. So that aspect of it was much easier. It was slow, um, but it was easier. Okay. Glad to hear there were some uh, positives there were. <laughs> among, amongst the potential mess. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. That concludes our time that we had today. Um, really appreciate the mix of topics and uh, different, different things that were covered today, all under the very broad umbrella of health law. Uh, we hope everyone, our panelists, our audience, everyone is uh, staying safe. And um, until next time, um, we'll have a, have a good day. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye.